Plants Gardener, I'm Tom Spencer. You know, we all want tough plants that survives whatever comes our way, but at the same time, some exotics are so exuberant they escape and swallow up native diversity. Today, Kelly Bender from Texas Parks and Wildlife picks a few alternatives that are equally tough, but that won't compromise ecological stability. On tour, let's visit a native garden devoted to plant and wildlife preservation. When Lynn and Jim Weber built their four-star rated greenhouse, they also took their philosophy outside. Jim and I are, are outdoor enthusiasts, and several years ago, we started thinking about how we were living, you know, and, and did it fit in line with our values. We love the outdoors, we like hiking and backpacking and running and bird watching and nature photography. And we started thinking if we really do care about the environment, we ought to look at how we're living. And we lived in a house that wasn't a green built house. It was really too big for us. It had a lot of room in it that we didn't ever use. And we were surrounded by non-native plants that required a lot of care and a lot of water. So we really started looking into what could we do. From early on during construction of their new house, they worked with landscape contractor Russell Womack for a design that factored in the property's sharp incline. From past experience, they knew he would work with the land and not against it. And we knew he knew a lot about native plants and would really respect the fact that we wanted all native plants in our landscape. And no lawn. No lawn. One of the other reasons we we're so concerned about it is because we ended up buying the property behind us, uh, which ended up um, bordering Bull Creek Preserve which is part of Balcones Canyonlands Preserve. And we wanted to make sure that what we were planting in our yard didn't invade or cause any issues and be good stewards of, of, that, of our property and of the property that borders it. We've been working very hard at getting rid of invasive non-native plants. We've taken out a lot of ligustrums, uh, some big ones that required some chainsaw work, and we've pulled hundreds if not thousands of little ones out of the drainage. We've taken Nandina out and, uh, and there are a few tallow and chinaberry we're taking out also. Along with Russell's help, they learned to identify the land's native plants through other experts, field guides, and neighbors Pat and Dale Bula, who forged awareness about native plants in the neighborhood. And we've also uh, went to plant rescues. We're members of the Native Plant Society of Texas, and we get invited to areas where developers are going to be putting in commercial buildings or residences. And people, the society will go and get permission to have their members come in and dig up and rescue plants to put in their own yards. Lynn and Jim made trails through their land, and now as Texas master naturalists and trained as volunteer Balcones land trail guides, they help others identify native plants and wildlife. To assist the trek, which has uncovered rare species, Russell and his crew hauled stones by hand. Near the house, he designed gardens that meld into the staging that nature designed. In front, he tapered the dramatic slope without compromising the land's character. The site was unnatural for a waterfall and pond, which attracts wildlife of all kinds. From the front porch, Lynn and Jim view a natural frame against the street and immediate opportunities to add to their list of wildlife they've spotted. We're very interested in finding out what's around us. And it started with birds, and it's evolved into butterflies and plants and reptiles and amphibians. We keep track of all the different things we see in the yard. It's really been quite amazing what you can find in a pretty small area. The front yard's emissaries promote their mission. I think a lot of people walking by our house stop and look and see. You know, I noticed just yesterday a woman with a baby stroller stopped at our sidewalk and was pointing out butterflies on one of our flowers to, you know, to the, their little baby. It ends up being energy efficient for us. We don't have to water as much. We have very few pest problems and we have wonderful diversity of wildlife. I think it really 
comes down to, I guess, a couple of things that make this a such a interesting way of landscaping your yard. One, purely economics. You don't have to water your lawn. You don't have to fertilize your lawn. You don't have to pay for lawn service or spend time with a mower to, you know, polluting the air, trying to keep your lawn looking the way you think it ought to look. So I think economically it's been a real benefit to do this. And uh, the other thing is just from an interest point of view, you see so much more in your yard than you would if you just had a bare St. Augustine lawn and a few non-native plants. One of the things I like to point out is that humans always Seem, the majority of humans seem to like to, com, to think of themselves as apart from nature instead of part of nature. And this kind of gets you closer to that. Um, by having all native things here, we spend a lot of time outside observing what's here. We see the cycles of butterflies. We see the cycles of plants. We see how things change during the seasons. And it's much more natural and how it should be because we're using things that are native to the area. And humans need to see that they're part of that cycle, that it's very enriching to your soul just to be out here and to see those things. It's almost like, um, I think there was a quote by Dante that said, nature is the art of God. And I really think that's true, that it's really important for people if they're stressed, if they're missing something out of their lives, that this can add something to their lives. And to have something for future generations. Jim talked about conserving resources. You know, that's important not just for us today, but for children and grandchildren of tomorrow. And that's one of the other main motivations to do this. Thanks for opening your garden gates to us. And right now we're going to be talking about protecting your wildscapes and your Texas plants from invader species from beyond. I'm joined by Kelly Bender from Texas Parks and Wildlife. Kelly is a wildlife biologist and a guest on the program in the past. Welcome back. Well, it's great to be back. Thank you for having me. We're in part, we're celebrating the release of a, your new book, which has just come out about wildscapes for Texas and uh, terrific uh, uh, production. Thank you uh, for the work and for uh, uh, what looks like a terrific uh, resource for Texans. Well, thank you so much. We we spent a lot of time on it, updating it, making mm -hmm. sure it had the best available information, mm -hmm. and it really helps gardeners um, put together a, a garden that includes food, water, shelter, and space. Those things that uh, wildlife, wildlife needs. needs. Yeah. yeah. It, and it, it I, you know, and to me, that's the greatest pleasure I get from gardening is the the bird species and the visitors that we get the butterflies <laughs> to me that's really the biggest payoff in the absolutely garden. I, I kind of feel like in my garden it's it's incomplete if we don't have um, the whole cycle the whole mm -hmm. the whole vision of what nature is and so this book helps us by provide showing us what native plants you can provide that put out uh, flowers and nectar and pollen and fruits and seeds and everything that wildlife need to survive um, in our urban oasis. All right. Well, it's, yeah. it's beautiful and it's, it's chock full with information and I really do recommend it to everybody out there. Um, now, the last chapter in the book mm -hmm. is focusing on our topic today, mm -hmm. which is invaders. And yeah. there are a lot of plants out there from others, other places mm -hmm. that don't have just a toehold in Texas. In some places, they're just rampant. Mm -hmm. And what, what's the problem with this in regards to, you know, our wild spaces and, and our wildlife? Oh, absolutely. A lot of those species were introduced um, through our gardens for ornamental use. Ah, mm -hmm. And uh, while we value them because they're, they're pretty um, and also because they do well just about anywhere, unfortunately that characteristic allows them to do well everywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. throughout the state. And the problem with that is that um, in order to have a good wildlife habitat that is that um, helpful for all wildlife species, you need to have a diversity of plant species as well because every plant provides a little different benefit. So mm -hmm. just like when you're putting together a team, an athletic team or a work team, you don't want to have everybody who has the same skill set. You want to have people who have different skills um, that contribute and make a, a better team for the for the project. Right. But uh, and in urban habitats or, or natural habitats out 
um, out in nature, we need to have a diversity of plant species that have different strengths and provide different mm -hmm. benefits as well. Well, we, I know that we really are impacting, and I, I, every time I go hike in the hill country, for example, mm -hmm. and, and I'm, I think I'm experiencing Texas. Right. Until I look at the plants beside the trail, mm -hmm. and I see Ligustrum and Nandina and all these species from Asia and other places mm -hmm. uh, that are overrunning the natives. Oh, and that's a fantastic point because a lot of times we plant things that we know or that we've seen elsewhere because we know that they'll do very well. Mm -hmm. But in doing so, we take away the Texas that we kind of came here to experience. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an excellent point. It's a sense of place that we lose, and a lot. A lot of times, I tell you what, the, the best way to ruin a good hike is to understand um, exotic plants. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah, it is, because you'll it, go around to some of the natural areas mm -hmm. here in Austin, especially, <clears throat> um, and you'll see a, a thicket of nothing but ligustrum, and all of a sudden, this beautiful green place with a lake is is just yeah i have to yeah. bite my tongue sometimes when i'm hiking with friends because they're all be saying oh look oh, how pretty gorgeous. everything is i'm like eh, darn ligustrums <laughs> <laughs> but that's a good realization to yeah. have because once you your eyes are open and you realize um you know this habitat isn't the best that it could be um, and and you wonder why all we see in downtown austin are grackles and mm -hmm. you know and rock dove or pigeon um, when we start planting a diversity of wildlife, we can start to see a whole host of different species, even in downtown Austin. Yeah, well, that's a good way to think about ligustrum, the <laughs> pigeons of the planet. That's right. <laughs> they are the pigeons of the planet. Well, there, let's uh, highlight a couple of these invader species. And uh, yeah. we, I just mentioned ligustrum. That's a huge plant family, some, sometimes called privets. Exactly. Um, but uh, bear fruit, which is the primary reason why they're so invasive. Absolutely. And, and flowers. And there, a lot of times people use them as uh, privacy shrubs, um, but the problem that they present is that nothing grows underneath them. Mm. First of all, they'll invade an area, whether it's been um, uh, disturbed or not. A lot of times exotic invaders, they'll only come in if, uh, if land is disturbed. Mm -hmm. But Ligustrum, and we'll talk about in a second Chinese tallow, they both can get a toehold just about anywhere, even mm. in really healthy habitats. So the problem is that nothing will grow underneath them. So um, they tend to like getting in the habitats that have uh, streams and, and water. Mm -hmm. And so um, by having completely bare soil and then these very tall ligustrum trees, when you have rain or, or flooding or anything like that, the soil doesn't stay on the ground. It right, moves on down. Right. Yeah. So, it so all down. sorts of problems associated with that, obviously. Absolutely. Another invade, you mentioned tallow and mm -hmm. You know, I, I think of these in Central Texas being sickly trees. Now, anywhere <laughs> east of here, I know they can quickly take over. In right. the hill country, I think of them as being chlorotic, et cetera, but you, they'll survive even in, with looking horrible, looking diseased. And throw out a bunch of seeds, too. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, they do really well in uh, in our area, pretty much only along the, the creeks. river. Yeah. yeah, creeks and rivers, riparian mm -hmm. areas is what we call them. Yeah. But just a little farther east in Bastrop even, you start mm. to see, uh, and you know when I was growing up in Houston, oh, yeah. they were uh, the prettiest fall color, and mm. that's why they were planted. That was one of the reasons that they right. were planted, That, um, along with industry and agriculture. And they've taken over hundreds of thousands of acres. Absolutely, down by the and they yeah. have changed um, areas that were wetlands mm. into dry uplands in, you know, less than a decade. Mm -hmm. um, so, so wildlife that require a wetland you know, they can't nest in Chinese tallow trees. Mm -hmm. So we do have some great alternatives to those species, though. All right. One mm -hmm. other invader to mention that I really want to zero in on, because I'm going to have to deal with this, is this spring in my own oh, garden. Oh, yeah. China berry. Oh, yeah, and China I, berry. Uh, I hate this plant. <laughs> <laughs> and it grows like crazy. And, you know, I, uh, I, I'm going to tell t tales out of school. Mm -hmm. I saw a neighbor who had dug uh, some china berries out from a, an area park and mm -hmm. had planted them in their yard. And it just about <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> killed me because once you get them in, they're really, really hard to get out. Now, we plant them because they have really pretty fall color. They're mm -hmm. yellow. Uh, but they've got these... Um, berries that cover the tree. They're kind of a sickly yellow, yeah. waxy kind of color berry. Mm -hmm. uh, but they will take over a, an area, especially if it has any kind of water, in, uh, in no time flat. Yeah. 
uh, well, don't don't get me started on China berry, <laughs> but we do have for almost all these plants there there are good alternatives. Oh, absolutely. And and these are all natives, and a, mm -hmm. a few that you wanted to highlight would start with like Carolina cherry laurel, which is an East Texas native, but grows well exactly. here. Exactly, it, it grows very well here, especially in the habitats that we've uh, we're thinking about putting them, or where mm -hmm. you might have put a ligustrum. Mm -hmm. So Carolina cherry laurel, it's an evergreen species, and it's a small tree or a large shrub, mm -hmm. and it acts a lot like a red tip photinia or a ligustrum or privet, mm -hmm. um, and it's a great alternative. It produces fruit, which is great for fruit eating birds like uh, thrushes and things mm. like that. So. Yeah, mockingbirds, etc. Oh, they love it. They absolutely right. adore it. Yeah. yeah. So, Carolina char cherry laurel. <laughs> uh, on your list is one of my all time favorite garden plants for Austin, and that is the desert willow. Oh, absolutely. It's gorgeous. You know, mm -hmm. if you're looking for something that's outlandishly ornamental, just mm -hmm. gorgeous, looks like it comes from Central Asia. Right. Try <clears> the <throat> desert willow. It's got these big trumpet colored flowers, uh, trumpet colored, trumpet shaped flowers mm -hmm. with purple and white and pink and um, different colors. Mm -hmm. You mentioned there are a couple of different yeah, cultivars. There's the one that I, that I was crazy about is brandy and I think that's actually probably a pretty good description for the color. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it, it's fine with drought. You know, mm -hmm. we've had such a horrible drought this past summer, but mm -hmm. it does very well. But anytime it rains, it'll shoot out um, just a gorgeous display of blooms. Yeah, and I you, love them. Often just summer long. Mm -hmm. You know, even in drought, summer long. Really? In, in, yeah. in my garden, in garden. And, and unwatered, just terrific, terrific plant. And mm -hmm. butterfly tractor, hummingbird tractor. Butterflies all over it all the time. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, well, one uh, last plant, just as an alternative to some of those real invader vines, coral honeysuckle is a good ch a choice. It really is. You know, it's a very well-behaved vine, and mm -hmm. uh, you don't. I mean, anybody who's ever tried to grow uh, wisteria or trumpet vine, mm -hmm. um, wisteria being a, an out, uh, exotic invader, uh, Chinese wisteria being an exotic invader, mm -hmm. um, knows that sometimes they can get a little aggressive. Yes, right. <laughs> um, but coral honeysuckle is fantastic. If you were to make a, a flower that was specifically for hummingbirds, this would be the flower yeah, for it. Absolutely glorious, yeah. a beautiful <laughs> color, one of mm -hmm. my favorite colors in all the garden, in fact. Yeah. So, Kelly, the, uh, again, the book is called uh, Texas Wildscapes, Gardening for Wildlife. And we really appreciate you coming on and sharing this information about the invaders because I, 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 this is something that is a particular thing that I think people really need to pay attention to. We're often the guilty culprits introducing these species to our wildscapes, and we need to take a little more ownership in this and sense of responsibility. So thanks so much for coming back on the show, and continue yeah. best wishes. We'll have you come back and talk more about uh, all the cool things about gardening for wildlife oh, in the future. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank Great. you so much. Great. Well, coming up next, it's our friend Daphne. Hello, and welcome to Down to Earth. Our question this week is how to tell if a plant is dead from the freeze. We had a very uncharacteristically harsh winter this year, and so many of us lost plants for, to the freeze. But also, you may not have lost that plant. Many of our plants and trees go dormant, and so they may look dead but not actually de be dead. So there's great things to check on those to make sure before you remove the plant. On trees, if you just take a knife and scratch lightly into some of the stems, you'll notice that there's green tissue underneath where you're scratching the, the stem, or there's not green tissue. This would be true also for your shrubs, maybe even more so. You could do this on a young tree, but on an older tree, those branches may be further away. But your young trees would have been more susceptible than your more mature trees anyway. This would be very common for a plant that might not be native to our area, your live oaks, your red oaks, other trees like that are not going to be susceptible. They're just going to be dormant. On annuals and perennials, of course, you would have lost your annuals because they would die in any sort of winter, but you want to see if they'll come back from seed this year, and they probably will. You may have collected the seed, and then you can put those out either this fall, if they're spring flowering wildflowers, or next spring. On your perennials, those will have died above ground, but they will definitely still be alive below ground if their roots have survived. And because our soil gets so much less cold than our air, it stays much warmer, then you will have less trouble with your perennials than you may think. So all the top growth will die back, but don't give up on those roots. Hopefully you mulch them very well and the plant stayed alive below ground. Our plant this week is bulbine frutescens. This is a clumping succulent 
and it continues with our theme of trying to promote plants that use less water but are still very beautiful in our landscape. This is a very small plant. It gets about a foot and a half tall and it spreads to about two feet. Each of the plants will clump and create more plants, which makes it very easy to divide. This plant comes in both yellow flowering and orange flowering cultivars, and the flower spikes get to about two feet tall. 10 to 15 flowers will form per plant, and they have very pretty flowers, which is important for all of our landscapes. They flower all the way from mid-spring through the fall, and they love our heat. They're native to South Africa, which makes them very heat and drought tolerant. But they're also hardy to around 20 degrees Fahrenheit. They love the full sun, but they can also take light shade. In the light shade, they may flower a little bit less, but that's easy to give up if you have a shady spot. Very, very low water on these. If you give them too much water though, they really won't mind too much. They may just not flower as much or may not look as healthy. So they're very adaptable to different soil types, which makes them another way to be great for our area. To do in your garden this week, start shopping for roses and prepare your beds for them. They've been available in our nurseries for a while, so you should have lots to choose from still. On bare root plants, it really is important to get them into the ground now. Container plants can wait a few more weeks or even a month until we warm up a bit. If you have a, if you have a history of brown patch in your lawn, go ahead and treat it now with fungicide. If you have a history of it, it probably will repeat this year, and so you do need to go ahead and take care of that now preventatively. It's also time to plant seeds of any spring flowering annuals that you have, and also perennials, such as calendula, Echinacea, Gaylardia, Hollyhock, and Sweet Peas. These are great plants for our area. We'd love to hear from you, so send us your question or plant of the week from your garden to klru.org ctg. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with Backyard Basics and Sweet Pea Hoover. Hello, I'm Sweet Pea Hoover. Welcome to Backyard Basics. Today we're going to explore some ways to battle weeds that are already in our yard or try to get it before they show up. We'll be discussing pre-emergence, post-emergence, when to apply, and how. Let's start with corn gluten, one of our most popular pre-emergence. And when we say that, we're trying to nip the seed before it germinates. Um, it's a powdered herbicide, and so you can sprinkle it at a rate that your nursery would be happy to help you with. It is best applied in mid to early February when you start to see the warmth come up for your daffodils. That's a great cue that you should be putting that down and getting those weeds before they start flourishing with our spring rains. Post-emergence are what is already existing and how we're going to beat them. We have some great natural products I'd love to explore with you. Our first one is Green Go. It is all food grade, um, vinegar, orange oil, uh, kind of pleasant smelling. You want to apply these things in either early morning when the sun can actually help battle these things, a little extra heat and burning. Uh, also, there's this great one for crabgrass. I know a lot of people are suffering from this right now. Um, if you actually open this up and smell it, it's delicious. It's cumin, it's cinnamon, it's corn flour. Uh, all you have to do is wet down your weeds and then apply this powder and the sun will take care of the rest by smothering it, um, basically breaking that little polymer coating that's on the weed. So it closely dehydrates and disappears. Another thing I want to talk about with weeding is making sure you're comfortable in your garden. First thing you can do is get a great pair of gloves. These mud gloves are one of my favorite products because it has this coating that keeps you waterproof, but also if we're dealing with something like sow thistle that has those nasty little prickers in it, it's going to protect my hands to make sure that I'm not discouraged from picking more of them. Another thing you can do for your comfort is a kneeler. It's just a great way to give that extra padding in the knees that can keep you out in your garden a little bit longer. My favorite weeding tool is this. They call it a Cape Cod weeder. The angling on this weeder, the sharp edge, as you can see, this is a well-seasoned one that I'm using every, every day, uh, can get right under that root. It has a great prying mechanism to get under a tap root, especially ones that are stubbornly in the ground. And something like henbit just whisks it away. If there's, you're not so much someone who wants to get on the ground, most of the tools that you're looking at here are available in a longer, longer sticked 
item or option for you. So uh, go ahead to your garden center and I bet they have something you wouldn't have to bend over with. One of those that's my favorite is called the oscillating hoe. Uh, some of my other gardeners know it by the name hula hoe. I love it because it's got two razor sharp edges that you could, with one motion can be doing double the work. It's great for granite paths if you have those or again for some of our shallow rooters. Again, my name is Sweepy Hoover. It's been great to talk to you about some of my favorite tools and ways to get rid of weeds naturally. Busy hands are happy hands, so get on out there. Watch online and get more tips at klru.org ctg. Next week, we've got tips for summer vegetables.